All right. Hello, Fortinas brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is October 26, 2024. And yes, I know that we're still here, but we know, we understand, we believe that we are so close that this is the season. I fully, uh, you know, I, I made a post in the, uh, excuse me, in the community post. I did it on Facebook and I did it in the Ministry Revealed forum to say I'm no longer of the belief, but I would have to say, <laughs> excuse me, in, in very hopeful in what I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. I touched on it in what I posted, but then what came about from this is much, much more. Um, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to be another doing another teaching until what I'm going to share with you uh, either happens or you know, comes to pass and, and we continue on from there. And because, you know, I just, Lord, what more? What more do we need? It's so crazy what we've been given to understand these past seven years. How much more confirmation and understanding before the Lord comes and, and finishes the work and, and completes the revelation to his remnant bride, that worker group that will serve him. And, you know, and so I always go to the Lord and just, Lord, every night, whatever what do you want to lead me in what do you want to make known and that's that's always my prayer that i'd be led in the spirit to just where do you want me to go next and as much as i was considering not doing another teaching till maybe tuesday because of what i'm going to show you and hoping that i wasn't going to be doing another one um a sister uh Ka Ka casey cassie uh in the ministry had posted something in in the comment that I had made in the post that I had done about this video. Now I hadn't gone into that video yet, and I still haven't. But what she had mentioned within it, in in what she had written, was very interesting because of something that another brother, our brother Brian, had posted in the forum from um from a, a teaching that Ken Johnson just recently did, and I caught some things in there that I had never seen before. Many people have said, well, you know, the sun and the moon, I mean, are they really off? I mean, I, I thought we, we've we proven it well enough. Well, I'm going to show you more insight. And, and to the point that, you know, some people say, well, you know, you shouldn't teach from the Apocrypha. But that's the whole point. We don't teach from the Apocrypha. We teach and get the revelation and show it from Scripture. And then months, sometimes years later, we end up finding things in the Apocrypha that then confirm these things even with more clarity. That is the way it has always, always worked. And so this was really, really interesting because it clearly, in this Apocrypha, in the, in the teaching that Brian had shared from Ken Johnson, Ken Johnson didn't catch it. He's, he's understanding it with with what we're going to see that he talks about, but then he reads through the part about the sun, moon, and stars. And it's because we don't all know the same things, right? Ken Johnson has some awesome teachings. He spends a lot of time. He's got so many books that he's written. He spends a lot of his time, if not all of it, with Scripture, but focusing on the Apocryphas and how much more they reveal. And we've been able to go in there sometimes and, and discern more things that he doesn't see because he doesn't understand the revelation of the Gospels, the 14 years, and how it all plays out. So needless to say, when we get there, it was so wild. I know you guys, when you see it, it's, it's so exciting because it confirms what we have shown. And if it confirms that, and we were just using the Hebrew calendar again knowing better then is it possible just maybe that we needed to add a few extra days well that's what we're going to start off with covering today and then we're going to go in to these two parts one with the sun moon and stars and the other one in relation to the mountains that are in this apocrypha writing that then lead us to the apocrypha with the book of uh of enoch that she was sharing with me and what was interesting, like I said, is I, I, I wasn't so sure I was going to do another teaching. I have a bunch of other tabs from just other things I was studying. And, you know, maybe we would have done something, but I wasn't sure. And it just so happened that I believe it was 
sorry if it's Cassie Casey. I'm going to say Casey. Sorry if it's not Casey. Um, she had said that it was her father who had been watching for years and kept getting her, you know, come and watch, come and watch. Watch that intro series. You'll really get it. And that's what happens when they, you watch that intro series. People watch that intro series. Man, it explodes their understanding of Scripture and of prophecy like never before for everybody that takes the time. Well, I believe her dad, if I remember correctly, that her dad is Uncle Jimmy, the one who takes care of our Facebook. And what was awesome about it is in the post that I did in the community, he was the one out of the, all of the comments that said, you know, it would be nice if we still had another teaching, even if you were going to maybe show to another date and, and try to pinpoint other things just so that we can get another teaching. And so he got me thinking, uh, maybe I'll do another teaching. And then his daughter, on a completely different topic and subject, sends me something else, and it was connected to something I had seen with Brian. And, uh, you know, so lo and behold, I sat down this last night and especially this morning, and I started going through this all, and I was like, man, it is so, so exciting. And so when I was studying in the garage this afternoon, I went in and, of course, sharing with my wife, as I always do. That's why my wife knows it. I say she knows it almost as much as I do. She'll be like, she'll tell you no, uh, definitely not. But I would say she pretty much knows it pretty darn close. And my daughter was with her today, too. So I gave uh, a 10-minute spiel breaking it down, and uh, it, it was just so exciting. You know, I say it all the time. I, I get fired up when when I study the word, when I understand more, when more revelation, more connections are conform, confirmed and, and shown. It, it's it, I, I don't know how to explain it, except, you know, I believe it's obviously the evidence of the spirit that's in us. Right. That we read the scripture and when when we can diligently search and seek them out and, and things come to understanding, as has been happening for seven years here. It is so incredible. It just, it never ceases to blow my mind and just at the end make me say, wow, why were we chosen for such a thing as this? Mysteries hidden since the beginning of creation revealed through us, all of us here, everybody playing their part in the end. It's absolutely just awe-inspiring. It's beautiful. And it's so incredible when you see it coming together. And so if you're new to the ministry, I always do this. Um, you're here, you'll hear me say things like uh, like you heard me say in the forum, posted in the forum. You can go to ministryrevealed.com right here from the YouTube channel or just type it in. And when you do, this is the website that pops up, but this is the intro page. So you can go to the menu right here. Here's all the different links. Here's the forum. So you can click on the forum. It'll take 5, 10 seconds to sign up. There's like 1,300, almost 1,300 people worldwide. Um, and it's it's free. It doesn't cost a thing. And it's like-minded brothers and sisters in there sharing, you know, events and news and, and Bible studies and all sorts of things going on in there. But this is where you can go. This is the intro. This is the page that I'm on. And if you don't want to leave YouTube, you can go to the playlist pl uh, link right here. And click on this link right here. The first four videos is the wow, catch everybody. You will never read prophecy the same again because you will begin to have understanding as you have never, ever had before. And yeah, that sounds like a bold claim if you're new. But I promise you, I promise you it'll be worth every moment of your time. And the first four videos are this one right here. This one is only 22 minutes. And it's the 22 minutes that will give you little tidbits of what the next three are about. The next one is a 30-minute Bible study of what we call who the Gospels are speaking to. You're going to come to understand that the Gospels, of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are speaking to three different groups of people, in, especially in the prophetic. What you come to find out is Matthew, Mark, Luke in the end. The last will be first. The first will be last. So Matthew, Mark, Luke becomes Luke, Mark, Matthew. And you're going to see that the differences within the Gospels, the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're going to see that the differences in the stories, like, for example, the story of the robes when Jesus is going to the cross. In Luke, he's arrayed in a gorgeous robe. It means white, radiant, and beautiful, like a bridal gown. In 
Mark, he's arrayed in purple, and in Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. I always say these people weren't colorblind, so what, what gives? We see that when Jesus is on the cross, his final words in Luke are, Father, into your arms, I commend my spirit. But in Mark and Matthew, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the word forsaken means left me, leave me behind. Did, did Jesus think he was going to be left behind? No. Well, why does Mark say it and Matthew say it, but Luke doesn't? It is going to blow your mind when you understand what it means. All of these differences within the same stories in the Gospels, how the Gospels are laid out on their pages, we can even prove. How some stories are in some Gospels, but not in the others. It'll blow your mind, and this is a 30-minute intro into that. Then what will happen is you will realize that the end of days is not seven years, but 14 years, and a little portion called above, which is 50 days. Luke's starts with the pre-trib, then you have the 50 days, and then the 14 years begin, which is Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel. You will see why there are differences in the discourses, and it'll blow your mind. This is where everybody starts to say, well, this guy's crazy. He's lost his mind. It is not 14 years. I promise you, the last two to 300 years of people teaching that it was seven years, they were wrong. They only had about half the story. And the reason is because, one, when you understand the differences in who the Gospels are speaking to, you will understand that Luke is speaking to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to the world, which is the Gentiles grafted into the house of Israel, which is the church that isn't ready, that are still caught up in the things of this world. And then Matthew's Gospel is to the house of Judah. So you've got the pre-trib, the, the, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, seeking and diligently searching him, loving, repentant, and then you've got the world church that, eh, not really paying too much attention. They're going to go through tribulation, but they're going to go through the tribulation of seals until the mid-trib great multitude rapture. And then you have Matthew's discourse and it relates to the seven years of trumpet judgments. And you see, when you understand this difference of the Gospels and, and realize that Matthew's Gospel is talking about the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives for the final 14th year of tribulation, then you'll understand, when you understand the differences in the Gospels, that the truth is a portion called above and then seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. And then you'll say, okay, well, that's crazy. Prove this to me. Well, first of all, start with that first 30-minute intro. This is only a second 30-minute intro. And then the fourth teaching is a big one. It's about two hours and 45 minutes worth every moment of your time called It's All Because of Matthew. And that's because the entire world of church for centuries has been taught from the Gospel of Matthew, not realizing that Mark was to another group and Luke was to another. And so what happened is in the is, so there's the was from creation to Christ, the is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, and the is to come is from the pre-trib until the end. In the is of all of these teachings, we've been told that the differences in the Gospels are only perspective. Well, when you're reading from the is, you can maybe point to some of that being true to fill in gaps in stories. But you can't do it everywhere. You can't do it with the differences in the robes. You can't do it with the last words on the cross. You can't do it with the story of Jonah and many others. But what happened is the whole world of church has been founded in the Gospel of Matthew and only looked a little bit to Mark and a little bit less even to Luke to pull out other tidbits to try to fill in the story of Matthew. And what happens with prophecy for the is to come people have done the same thing because they didn't know any different that's been the wildest that that is the foundation of the revelation here in this ministry once you understand who the gospels are speaking to prophecy will open up to you as it is never have in your entire life i promise you we've been doing this now for seven years and for seven years week in week out month in month out year in year out more and more and more and more prophecy has been revealed 
and every time we find new parts and new pieces they fit in the exact same place where they should have based on the other portions of prophecy so the answer to everybody believing only in seven years is because their entire focus is founded in the gospel of matthew when you begin to see the differences in the gospels and what this what the scriptures tell us about the years everything begins to open up all right <clears throat> so with that man it's so exciting that's my favorite part you know i talk about it 99 percent in all videos i talk about that intro series a lot of people skip all of this because they've heard it so many times but if you're new that's you're the one i'm doing it for if you're new or newer and you haven't yet gone to watch that intro series you're the people that i do it for because i promise you if you're thirsty for the word and you're thirsty and you're digging into prophecy and trying to understand these things i promise you you've been led to the right place just take the time to look into those videos watch them study them ask the spirit to lead you in them and you will never ever ever see prophecy the same again nor should you because you will understand as you've never seen before all right so let's start with this right off the bat because this is a big deal we were all a little bummed uh what was it we were all a little bit kind of bummed this past thursday going into friday this was our highest watch yet and now we're right here and it was disappointing waking up even on Monday. It should have happened even before bed was the expected time. But it didn't happen. And it was a little bit of a bummer. But what, did I, what have I been saying in the teachings? I said that there is a chance. I didn't know that it was for sure. But there was a chance, a possibility, that we would see Israel strike Iran. And in seeing Israel strike Iran, what would come next? What would come next would be the pre-trib and Iran then striking Haifa and Tel Aviv. You see, what did Israel just do, brothers and sisters? We were, we were, we were disappointed. You know, we've, we've been through this before, so we've got thick skin. We know it's around here somewhere. But it was a little bit disappointing. And what happened by Friday, late afternoon, our time? Bam. Fox News can confirm that Israel has started their attack against Iran following a ballistic missile attack that was launched against Israel earlier this month. Explosions have been reported in and around the Iranian capital of Tehran. There we go. I don't know. I don't think we need to go too, too far into it. I'm sure everybody listening, if you're prophecy, if you're following world events, everybody has heard and understood now that Israel has attacked in Iran. And then last night, they put out a one minute video and it was their military guys saying that they have concluded their attack. And now that's it. And if Iran wants to retaliate, then we'll retaliate. So it's like, Strike, retaliate, 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 retaliate. You know, it's never ending. And so, well, it appears to be never ending. But we know what's coming. Israel, I was watching another one from a general, and this is the first time Israel has struck in Iran with such devastation. Now, it wasn't complete devastation. It was targeted attacks to military places like the, uh, the IRGC, I think it is for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, their headquarters, and many other places and, and systems for, uh, uh, for, for planes coming in and, and shutting them down and, and blowing up a bunch of things. 120 jets they flew into Iranian airspace to block communications and to drop bombs there, targeted bombs. Now, this is the first, th this has never happened in Iran, where they have actually gone in and done this in Iran. But not only is it in Iran, brothers and sisters, it was in their capital. Right in the northern part or southern part as well of, of the capital. Not right downtown, but in the military places of the capital of Tehran. 
What do you think? What do you think comes next? We know it's going to go back and forth. Do you think Iran? Do you think this is done? We know it's not done. In fact, what do we know comes next? We know <coughs> that Israel, or sorry, we know that the pre-trib bride of Christ will vanish. The pre-trib, the Luke group, those in Christ spirit-filled will vanish before Iran drops on Haifa and Tel Aviv. I don't mean just, you know, they're going to launch more in, in other random areas. I mean an attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv where probably thousands will die, maybe even more. What will happen first is Luke 21, 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the pre-trib verse. The, there are others, but this is the pre-trib verse in all of Scripture. And then what happens? The bonds drop on Haifa and Tel Aviv. The, the revelation we have shown in many places from six years ago, we've been showing this, that the portion that's 50 days above, that starts before the 14 years, begins with the pre-trib, and then there's attack one, which will be in two northern cities that are, that are historically a typology of Zebulun and Naphtali. It, this one is the first one, is the one called the light affliction. And then later, after that, which is after this seven-day short war that will break out after, then who shows up? The Son of Man will show up as light shining in the darkness, before the end of those 50 days and Syria comes, compasses them about, and then after the 50th day, destroys them at the time of the red horse rider and the beginning of the 14 years. Israel just attacked Iran in their land around their capital. Do you think maybe they're going to strike back in their capital, which is Tel Aviv. And prophetically, we've been saying for seven years or for six years. And over the last few, two, three years or so, we've known that it was Zebulun and Naphtali, which is a typology, a prophetic typology for us of telling us of what we've understand of it being Haifa and Tel Aviv. Hello. We've understood these things, right? So what was it that we had been looking for? Well, we were talking about the, sorry, one sec. We were looking at what we knew of June being the Hebrew month of Savan. Now, the Hebrew months to us right now don't mean anything. The only reason I bring up the month Savan is because in the month of Savan is the month of Taurus. Okay? It's the month of Taurus. And this right here, according to the beginning of creation, was month one, day one. And what did we do? We had realized just recently that it appears, according to Scripture, that the... That the uh, um, beginning of creation we know was in Taurus. In fact, let me bring that up real quick. We know that it was in Taurus. You guys have seen me share this many, many, many times. We know that, where is it? Uh, Mark the Bronze Age, even 4000 BC to 1700 BC. It was uh, Pleiades closest to the sun at the vernal equinox. We see it was called the Bull of Heaven. We, we've showed it many times down here that even to the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in their zodiac, and consequently, it was represented by the first letter of their alphabet. Who is the beginning? Jesus is the beginning, right? Jesus is the Aleph and the Tav. The Aleph is the head of Taurus. It's the ox, and the Tav is the cross. 
number one of their alphabet, number 22 of their alphabet. We understood what all this means. We got this revelation confirmed to us, shown to us, or revealed by the Holy Ghost. We understood what this meant. We've shared on it many times. And in this count, we said, well, wait a second. If this is the count, when we went back to creation, we saw that in creation, there's the beginning. So who is the beginning? Jesus is the word beginning. It's Jesus who is the beginning. He is the Aleph. Okay? He's Taurus. He represents Taurus. So in the beginning, which was in Taurus, we saw that then the Lord God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And what I concluded based on all of this is that the in the beginning, he didn't make the moon dark. He made it light, which means it was the sun, which was at the time of the equinox, but because the Jews added a month this year, it equaled exactly the solstice. And the moon needed to be full because that's how they were. It was a light at creation. And I used to struggle with this all the time. I thought, you know, there's a, a, a brother out there teaching on the other side of, on, of Canada, <clears throat> and he's been teaching this for like 15, 20 years now, that the full moon is the beginning of the month. But we didn't get this. It didn't sink in till about, what, a month or two ago? That it really started to say, well, wait a second. Because what we had done in, in the beginning is we were still counting Nisan as month one and then two and then Savan was month three. And we were saying the 15th day of the third month, which is Jesus' birthday. And then we were counting from there. We knew that it was the seven Sabbaths that brought it to here. And this would be attack one connected to the ninth of Av. And then attack two was connected to Tishri one. Okay as recorded historically, and what else did we know? We knew, <coughs> excuse me, that Jesus was born on the 15th of Savan, right? We know Jesus was born, I should say, on the third month, 15th day, and we see it right here, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. So when he came and walked in the darkness, it sounded like it was at his birthday. But we soon realized it wasn't at his birthday because we found out when he fulfilled Isaiah 9 from the was prophecy in the is, it said that when Jesus fulfilled it and came walking through Zebulun and Naphtalim, when he came uh, um, and sat, uh, uh, which the people who sat in darkness saw a great light, he was fulfilling this from Isaiah 9. But when did he fulfill it? When John was now cast in prison. You see, it couldn't have been at the time of Jesus' birthday, as we've shared before, even though it sounds like it was connected to Jesus' birthday, for unto us a child is born, because at, in Luke chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized by John, it was the time of his birthday. Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, and John had just baptized him. And then Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, and then he came out, got disciples, was baptizing them. And in John chapter 3, we see John was baptizing his guys and Jesus was baptizing his. And then John was taken into prison. We know that it was about two months. And what did we find out about that two months? Well, what we were doing is we were saying, okay, well, this was Jesus' birth on the Hebrew calendar. And that brought us to this time right here. So if this was the escape, and it was attack one and attack two, then you had one, two, three, four, five, six, whoops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then the Lord coming on the eighth day. We know that the Son of Man is the white horse rider. He is coming after the seven-day wedding in heaven, after the attack on Haifa and Tel Aviv, the light affliction, that's coming from Iran, as we've been teaching for years. It'll last for about seven days, and then it'll settle down, and the Son of Man is going to show up as the white horse rider. He's here for three days. There's, uh, sorry, for 40 days. 
and then there's three more days, and that's when Syria will come with his, with their people. Jerusalem will be compassed about, and Jesus will have been warning the people to flee for the 40 days before he left. And then Jerusalem gets compassed about, and at the end of those 30 days, on what would appear to be Tishri 1, like history, Jerusalem is then destroyed. And the 14 years begin at the time of the Red Horse Rider. Okay? But, obviously... This time came and went. We were watching this for a year. We were watching no other date except for this time frame for a whole year because we understood what it was connected to in its timing. We know it's connected to the Feast of Weeks and its observance. But then we realized there had to be a year's end. There had to be a... We, we noticed from uh, Exodus 34, 22 when it would be observed connected to a year's end. So then what happened? Well, then what happened is we were no longer counting from back in Nisan and saying that this was month three because we realized in creation it was in Taurus at the sun and the full moon. And this only happened this year. I've said it a few times lately that for the next 30 years, this doesn't happen again where it's the sun at the, at the equinox or I mean at the solstice with the full moon and it being in Taurus all at the same time, just like creation. So then what did we realize? Oh, we start counting from here. So this full moon becomes day one and this becomes month one as it was in creation because we're in Taurus. Okay? That was month one, day one. And this was because of everything over the last four and a half years with the leading of the Spirit that began with the revelation of right on target that led us to bullseye and Taurus being the beginning. So this becomes month two, day one. This becomes month three, day one. Okay, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end was the conversation of this. And if Jesus was born on the 15th day, then this is the 15th day of the third month from a Taurus full moon count, okay? Start of the month. Third month, 15th day equaled September 2nd. And then what do we say? Ah, this equaled Jesus' birthday, but as we knew from Isaiah 9, from the connection from, from John 3, from, from Luke, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 3, from understanding these things and how long John was still around having been before he was put in prison, which was about two months, and then 10 months in prison before he was beheaded because it was a year, we understood the two months difference. And then what did we do? We said, okay, one, two months. And what did the calculation reveal? That the Son of Man would come, depending what side of the world you're on, October 31st, and on the other side of the world in the east would be November 1st. So we were showing this connection to the Son of Man coming on October 31st, okay? Which means prior to that, there was the pre-trib, the seven-day wedding, and then the Son of Man coming for his 40 days. So why was this such an exciting point right here as well? From right here to right here. What made this so extremely exciting because of everything it was connected to. Well, <clears throat> it's because of John 7. Well, not only because of John 7. Remember, we have also the chapters to years. So we had John 7 going into John 8. And it was a big deal. We knew its connection and how it plays out in chapters to years. How it lines up with Genesis in the first 21 chapters. And what did we see? It says it was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles at the beginning of John 7. And here's Jesus, the last day, that great day of the feast. Then we see, where is he going to go? To the Gentiles? And they all go to their own home. And then all of a sudden, if you go to the scriptures, excuse me, the scriptures about it, we read in John chapter 7 at the very end, we read, the woman caught in adultery. We go to chapter 8, and it starts 
exactly like the end of Luke's discourse, watch and pray to be accounted worthy in chapter in chapter 21, verse 36, which is the pre-trib verse. And then it goes into early in the morning, Jesus went to the mount, went to uh, uh, to the temple and they came early to sit with them and to listen. And he taught them. And there's the story of the woman caught in adultery, which is the prophetic picture of the bride being taken, the stone's throw that's going to be cast. And then what does it say? Here's a prophetic picture of then the Lord coming, just as Isaiah 9, just as so many places prophetically lined up directly to it, here he is coming to shine his light in the darkness. This is the beginning of his 40 days. It's the same as Genesis chapter 1. That beginning count that gets us to this point, starting in Taurus was the beginning. It's the gap theory that we've broken down so many times in its meaning. And then in verse 3 of Genesis 1, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Who was this light? God the Father made Jesus light in verse 3. And what it, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. The light day, the night darkness. You see? This right here was Christ coming in the same prophetic picture of when he's coming to begin the 40 days as the Son of Man. And so, look at where it was connected to. We see this as the last day. It's connected to the last day of tabernacles, and then this is the beginning. And what did we study? What did we find out? If you go read about Simchat Torah, the Jews end their Torah portion right here, and they start over again on Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1 is the beginning of Genesis related to those called the beginning, those who are in Christ, spirit-filled with the Spirit of God. So it was very, very exciting. Everything was pointing here, including, guys, the reason we've continued to diligently seek and search this year, why we didn't already stop back in August or early September. Because we know that the scriptures have revealed this is the 70th year. There is no extended count in the revelation of this being 70 years. So what, what was missing? Well, what did we account for? Did we not account for the sun? If you recall, we did a teaching on this about two to three months ago. We knew it. And this was about a teaching I had done about, give or take, two years and change ago, about not only understanding that the sun was off course, that we can prove it and we know it, but that the moon was off course as well. And if the moon was off course, let me go back to this one. And if the moon was off course, this wasn't, sorry, give me one sec. This right here in June, this wasn't the correcting of the moon. You know what I mean? Just because we went from, from dark moon and then said, no, the beginning of the month is full moon, that wasn't the correction. If you recall from that teaching about we knew it and what was taught on it a couple of years prior, it was the fact that we know the Jews every two to three years add a month of 29 days. They add a second Adar once every two to three years. If you're adding a month once every two to three years on your calendar, that means for the two to three years in between, you are unequivocally, absolutely, un you, you can't say anything about it. It is absolute that they are obviously falling behind in their calendar every single month until they correct it and catch up by one month. It's not, it's not a kind of, it's an absolute. And the evidence is the fact that they add a month. And we've spoken on that. So what was the evidence? It, or what was what we corrected? It wasn't just going from dark moon to full moon. Okay, because we realized this was the creation story. But if you remember how we got here with the moon. 
when they added, and I did several, several years going back, and then as you guys know, I went 30 years forward. And in counting, I can count within a day how many uh, uh, days the moon is off in a year going forward. And when they corrected it, when they added a second Adar in 2024 before their new year of Nissan began, there were three days too little. Uh, there were three days, I should say, extra because there was 26 days and they added 29. I've done that count. I showed you guys the count, which means there had to be one, two, whoops. There had to be one for Nissan, two for IR, and three days into Savant. And lo and behold, at the solstice, the full moon in Taurus, it equaled this time for the first time in the next 30 years right on that date that was powerful that was exciting well you know what we forgot or what i should say i forgot and some of you guys probably already knew this was going to come i get a, i get a little ahead of my skis because we just saw what it equaled in all of this count <laughs> that equaled Jesus's two months after his birth, because John was now in prison, equaled right here from that Taurus count in full moon. So, of course, the seven to eight days earlier would be right here, and that's exactly in the John chapters to years and Genesis. It was exactly there. So that's why it was so disappointing. But, but, what wasn't accounted for? You know it. You already know, right? I've been leading into it the whole time. What wasn't accounted for? The moon. If the moon goes off course by about one, uh, one day every month, then that means one, two, three, four. It's about four days off because the moon has come out too early. You'll recall from Isaiah 24, and you're going to want to remember some of this because this is going to lead us into more revelation, more confirming revelation. In Isaiah 24, verse 20, starting from 21 to 23, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. Okay? What do you think those are? You think maybe the sun, moon, and stars? And the kings of the earth upon the earth. And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. And they shall be put up in the prison. And after many days shall they be visited. You're going to want to remember that. You're going to want to remember this conversation right here. And then it says, Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. That sounds to me like something's happened with the sun and the moon as well. Who are the high ones? Well, it's also the stars. So it's connected to the stars and something with the sun and with the moon that have fallen that have fallen there's no reason if the moon has kept its place that it would be confounded or that if the sun had kept its place it wouldn't be ashamed what do we know these are prophetic pictures of they represent people right or angelic beings we've taught on this we know this right <clears throat> i'm going to prove this i'm going to prove this as we continue forward here tonight so Knowing this, having understood this, we then went to the Book of Jubilees, right? And in the Book of Jubilees, we know all about this airing that takes place. It says, and walk according to the festivals of the Gentiles. So this is, you know, they, they aired and went off course, okay? The Jews go off course. 
uh, and walked according and walk according to the festivals of the Gentiles after their errors and their ignorance. Okay, so this is the Gentiles. This is the church walking in their error and ignorance, and this is the Jews walking in their errors. And it just so happens that we read in Mark and in Matthew that they have erred not understanding the scriptures. But it doesn't talk about the erring that happens in Luke. There's no conversation about Luke's portion or in Luke's gospel about them having erred. And then what does it say? And there will be those who will make observations of the moon. For this one, the moon, corrupts, corrupts the stated times and comes out early each year by 10 days. I didn't say it. We just read it. So it comes out 10 days early every year and it corrupts the course. Well, what do we know about it? It's actually not 10 days. It's about, it, maybe it used to be, but now it's 11 and a quarter days, right? We see it right here. Since the period of 12 such lunations, a lunar year, is 354.8 hours, 40 minutes, 48 minutes, seconds, and so forth, days, purely lunar calendars are 11 to 12 days shorter than a lunar year. Jubilee said the exact same thing, but not just that it was shorter, but that it came out too early because it, it corrupts everything in the year. So what do we know about it? We know that it's obviously, or essentially, quote unquote, precisely, 11 and a quarter days. It's about 11 and a quarter days. Watch what happens when we do 11 and a quarter days, okay? Let's go, whoops, let's go 11 and a quarter days divided by 12 months in a, in a, in a solar year is 0.9375. So this is how much the moon falls behind every month over the course of a year, okay? To, to end up being 11 and a quarter days short. Now watch what happens. Let's multiply this because how many months has the moon fallen short since it was in the right place at the right time for the first time over the next 30 years for the first time right there? It was one, two, three, four months. So what does that equal? We multiply this by four, three days, 3.75, three and three quarter days. So at three and three quarter days, we were looking <clears throat> essentially on our side of the world in the West, we were looking at the evening here and on the East side of the world, it would be over here. Because what are we looking for? I believe that the escape will happen Jerusalem time sometime between dawn and sunrise, okay? Sometime in the dawn portion is when I believe it will take place. So we were looking in the west from here, in the east to here, okay? And we did this because this was the last great day from John chapter seven, and then the story begins in chapter eight with the pre-trib connected to Luke 21, all of these. But of course it didn't happen. But we've accounted for the sun. That's what got us here. Because it's not really Tishri, although it's the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, according to John. But if the Lord is bringing everything back to as it was in the beginning, then the seventh month isn't really the seventh month, it's the fifth month, right? And if this is fifth month, day one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this would be like the ninth of Av, just like we were looking at when we were looking back in August, right here, from the 12th into the 13th. It was the exact same count, but a Taurus full moon, month one, day one, beginning. It brought us to this right here. But we know that the sun, that the moon has gone off course. We know Jubilees has proven it, has told us for a long time. We've counted it. I can literally count any month to any year and show how much it's off by and know that when the Jews add their 29-day month, 
every two to three years. Sometimes it's too few days and sometimes it's too many days. And I could show how many within about a, a one day period because, you know, the calculating of the quarter days and so forth. That, that was powerful to understand because you realize, wait a second, how else are you to understand then? The 10 days being off of Jubilees. How else are you to understand this incorporating and trying to track things on the Jewish calendar, knowing that their calendar is clearly off, yet what did I do again? Well, because of what Scripture said, I lined it right back up into Scripture. Last great day, and then boom, here it goes. But what did I do? I was on the Hebrew calendar again. But God said that the end will be as it was in the beginning. And what was the beginning? The sun and the moon had to be accounted for. Well, if this brought us to the sun being accounted for, but it didn't yet account for the four months, about four months, four days for the moon, maybe we should account for it. Because the only reason, brothers and sisters, the only reason we are looking at this time frame and we're looking at this time frame that has just passed, the only thing that got us there was the revelation of as it was in the beginning. And the only reason we continued on it was because we know this is the 70th year. So if we've tracked because of the 70th year, <coughs> excuse me, if we've tracked because of the revelation of the sun and everything beginning in Taurus, then maybe the only other thing we still need to track, like we did in previous teachings that the other things we were looking at, is maybe we still need to track the moon. And if that's three and a quarter, three and three quarter days, we'd be looking at one, Two, three, and about three quarters. So maybe Sunday into Monday. So maybe somewhere in this time frame right here. Sunday into Monday, the 27th to the 28th. I'm not saying exactly what time. I don't know what time. I'm not sure if it's the 27th or it might be the 28th. But now we have the sun and the moon accounted for from Taurus as it was in the beginning. So what does this day equal? Well, it still is the end of Shemini Aretz. It still is the end of the great, eight, the eight, great, great eighth day. It still is these things. Because these aren't really these things. You get it? Because the moon had to be accounted for. That's like saying this right here isn't where the full moon should be. Because by this point, it's already off that three days and three quarters. So it's not like I'm just saying, oh, it just happens right here and we're only making the account right here. No, it's there would have been two and three quarters, one and three quarters, bringing us back to where it was. You know what I'm saying? This is just the culmination of all of it being added together where it would actually be. So what would this actually be as it was in the beginning and the, the moon remaining on its course following with the sun remaining on its, on its course? It would be the equivalent of this exact day right here. That's why when people are sharing, no, it, the, the, 21st, the 31st of October, I, I can't, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I can't, I can't, I can't piece it together. If these if this day 27th 28th <clears throat> excuse me from somewhere in here if if this comes and goes and we wake up Tuesday oh, okay maybe I'll definitely be looking to here I'll definitely be looking to before the election or even election day in the US but I cannot compute it on all the revelation that I've understood I cannot reconcile that because the sun has been accounted for, the moon has been accounted for, the stars have been accounted for, the rest falls apart. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't account. And that's why, as much as I was saying, <clears throat> when this day came and went, I said, okay, well, you know, I, I don't believe but I'm hopeful from here on for, here on out until, of course, Israel attacked in Iran. 
in an unprecedented attack never before have they done on Iran. We shared that here, that that's what we could see before the escape because the bride will be vanished before Iran returns the attack and because it was on their capital, in their, in their capital, right, and around their capital on the outskirts, then I would see Iran now going to their capital and their two major cities. Well, what were people saying? People were saying from this attack that they foresee, and this doesn't mean much, but they foresee one, two days, they figured about 48 hours, maybe less, before Iran would attack back, and this time going bigger than they had before. They were saying 1,000 ballistic missiles, which had gotten through Israel when it was 180. I, I do believe we're here. And this is the place I'm looking at, 27th. Later in the day, 27th, depending what side of the world you're in, till the evening of the 28th. This is the span of time that I'm looking to right here. Stars accounted for. Moon accounted for. Sun accounted for. Because they have fallen. And this is what you're going to see next. We're going to be able to approve, I mean, prove with apocryphas, <clears throat> with an apocrypha, that this indeed is the case. So, what else does this do? Well, if this becomes the pre-trib, let's just say on our side of the world it'll be right here, other side of the world it'll be there, okay? So in this time frame, this is the pre-trib, we'd have one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Which means this from November 3rd to the 4th, so November 3rd on our side of the world, November 4th on the other side of the world, would be the coming of the Son of Man after the wedding, after the seven day wedding, coming on the eighth day, as we've taught on so many times. I kind of, you know. Uh, am I and I, am I more hopeful for? It? Well, I'm just more hopeful because this will be the escape. But as a as a worker, as believing I'm remaining to serve the Lord with many of you, when He returns from the wedding and He gathers us, as we've taught from from Luke 12 into Luke 14, we know that that remnant group who was going to be taken with the bride pre-trib will have been chosen to remain to stay and serve the Lord that when he and when he returns and knocks from that wedding that they would open unto him and he would come and sit with them and serve them and eat with them we've taught it from Luke 12 to to Luke 14 what happened the banquet that happens after the wedding it's only found in Luke there's a reason for it and it connects to Luke chapter 24 the only group, the two on the road to Emmaus, where the Lord sat down with them and ate and served them. It's the same group. It's the Smyrna group. It's the remnant workers that will serve the Lord during tribulation. That will take part with them and in his glory, like Romans told us. Like, like, like 1 Peter told us. And they will take part in his glory because they're going to be the ones resurrected to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign. Sitting with them in his throne as he sits with his father in his that same group is the smyrna group explained to us in the seven churches explained to us at the at the end of tribulation and at the end of this age from revelation 3 the seven church of laodicea we know what's coming it's just a matter of when and why why does this why am I a little bit more smiley for this? Well, because November 3rd, for those of you who some of you maybe already know, but November 3rd is my birthday. So November 3rd is my birthday, and I just find that kind of interesting, kind of maybe more hopeful, I should say, than anything, right? And why? Well, 
We're the ministry that the God, that the book has been open to. So kind of maybe like a little treat. Maybe I'm looking a little bit too far into it, right? Because because I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that that now we've got the moon accounted for, that this would be the time in here, which would make this the eighth day in the return of the Lord. What a birthday present that would be. I just think that's pretty wild. So did I make it equal that? No, it had nothing to do with my birthday. It has nothing to do with my birthday. It's the revelation of everything that God is here with the stars and with the sun. We needed to account for the moon. Uh, and we've talked on it for about two, two and a half years. This would be it. Sun, moon, and stars in account from as it was in Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning. So now here becomes a question. Because what about what we taught already? What about the fact that Arcturus, we thought was connected, right, to October 31st? So what about in Boothies and, and Arcturus and the connection to the timing of Arcturus? How, how could Arcturus be then connected also to over here? Well, let me show you. It already told us. Every Halloween, listen to this, and a few days before and after. Every Halloween, a few days before Halloween, and a few days after Halloween, the brilliant star Arcturus, uh, brightest star in Boothies, the herdsman, sets, sets at the same time and on the same spot on the western horizon as the summer sun. This star rises at the same time and in the same time in place on the eastern horizon as the summer sun. Because remember what we shared on this, right? That it's like the sun, that, that it would be at, at a year's end and its movement was like the sun. And what we revealed about it being connected to the herdsman. Well, we were just being very specific of it being Halloween and validly so because everything was equaling right here which would put him coming right here in the west and to right here in the east so it was connected to halloween but it did not say it was only at halloween when it happened it said for a few days before and for a few days after hello a few days is about three or more days, generally three days. So for a few days before and a few days after, that puts it right in the same time frame. It has not changed the conversation in the recent teachings of Boothies and specifically Arcturus, which, of course, as we know, is mentioned in Scripture. So here's... Our update. This is now what I believe the time frame we're looking for. Evening of the 27th into the 28th. I'm not saying the western side of the world, the eastern side of the world. I'm just saying wherever it will be, will be, I believe, somewhere in here. I don't know exactly which one. I don't know what time. It might be that it's right here, Jerusalem time, and that's the dawn because I believe we're going at dawn, or it might be that the dawn is right here, which would make it in the evening portion on the west over here. So you see, where exactly is it going to be right here, dawn, or here, dawn? I don't know, but connected to somewhere equivalent in the west to here. All right, so now you have my, my latest update on where I believe it's going to be. and. It's my hope. I, I don't know how much I could believe. Is this really going to be it? But I'm hopeful. <clears throat> because everything from this point forward, for this year, I can't account for. 
I, I can't account with the sun and the moon going to the 31st. I can't account going to the 3rd or to the 5th as pre-trips. I can't account for it. Does it mean just because I can't account for it that it's not going to happen? No. There could be something I don't yet understand. But in relation to the stars, giving account to the sun, giving account to the moon, and literally being able to account for them, to be able to show it in calendars, in counts, in the sun, moon, and stars, and in scripture, and in the Apocryphas? That's why. That's why I say, you know, once we've accounted for it all, it brings us to no later than in this time frame right here. And afterwards, I, I, can't, I can't account for it. But it doesn't mean it can't be. It could just be we don't yet understand it. But how are you going to account for this from John if it's already passed? How are you going to account for that with its connection from Genesis 7 into 8, like John 7 into 8? There's only one thing left that accounts. The moon. Which we've already been led in the understanding of over two years ago. So I am hopeful. I am hopeful. But like many of you have said in the post that I did, we are mature enough. We've been doing this for seven years. Some of you from the beginning. Some of you newer. Some of you for a few years. That's okay. We can take deep breaths. We know where we're at. We can see what's happening. And above all, we just saw Israel attack Iran at their capital, in their capital city. That was what fired up the, the, the forum ministry yesterday. This was, I believe, our sign. This was game on. That's what this was. Now it's just a matter of when will Iran retaliate and they won't just do it in kind, but I believe in kind on the capital, it'll be the Haifa Tel Aviv, it'll be the Isaiah 9, and before it hits, the bride of Christ will not see it. The bride will be taken, and that hit will come, and then a Middle Eastern war will break out for the next week. This was a massive, massive deal. Now watch this. Let me prove out to you more in relation to the sun and the moon. Watch this. This is from this is from the book of Noah. I think it's the the fragments of Noah. It's from column 13 and it has to do with uh, um what is it the 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 testament the testament of the empires uh from the from the testament testimony of the empires give me one sec i'm bring it up on my phone real quick it's from oh prophecy of the empires testament of noah okay we're not going to read all of this portion right here i'm just going to read a little bit right here you're going to recall something else that was spoken about. And then we're going to watch a little bit of Ken Johnson's video. And you're going to hear it more clearly. You're going to hear from a guy who I would call a professional in relation to uh, the Apocryphas. And you're going to hear what he says these things mean. And if it means these things with the stone, the clay, the gold, the silver, then what do you think it's going to mean for this right here? The exact same thing. You'll see what I mean in a second. It says, uh, so over here it's talking about uh, the stones, the clay, the gold, the silver, okay, the iron. And then it's, and it says that they were chopping trees, taking them for themselves. And then it says, as I continued watching, the sun, the moon, and the stars, they were chopping, taking it for themselves themselves i was watching until the swarming things of the earth and the swarming things of waters consumed it so the waters uh, uh ceased and it 
ended. You're going to see what this means. You might be saying, what on earth is this talking about? Oh, you're going to see what it means. Ken explains it very well, and then he skips over the sun and moon because he doesn't understand what that portion is talking about. But you're going to see him talking about it with this, and then we're going to bring it in to the sun and the moon, and you're going to understand why this right here from Isaiah 24 was said, that when that day comes to pass, the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones, the stars, <coughs> specific stars, and they will become his prisoners. And the moon and the sun will be confounded and ashamed as well. Okay, let's have a listen to this. We'll listen to the first uh, four minutes or so. And then we're going to, we'll probably jump in here once in a while as well. And just so you're aware, I have him on 0.5. I listen to this guy on uh, double speed. I could probably easily, everybody could listen to this guy on triple speed. He speaks very slowly. So I'm going to leave it on uh, 50%, uh, uh, 1.5 speed. And so if you're listening to this real fast already, uh, it shouldn't be too big of a deal. So here is the part of the dream that we have. So the angel's talking to him and it says, you, Noah, the king, are this. One of the part of it is he sees this large tree. And you can see this, this same kind of a thing in, we haven't got to it yet, but in Daniel chapter uh, three and four, it continues on with the prophetic parts. Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue. And then later on, he goes insane for a number of years. And he starts off by seeing a dream with this large tree. And Daniel interprets the tree as him because he's the king of kings. So you'll see that through the scrolls and other writings. When there's a dream of a large tree, it means the central world empire. So it'd be Adam and his descendants until after the flood, then it would be Noah and then his descendants, whoever would be king of the planet. So in Noah's dream, he sees this large tree. So obviously it's him. So it says uh, he sees this tree, there's a decree, and all the forests and all the birds of heaven and all the beasts of the field, all the cattle of the land and creeping things from the dry ground basically are under this large tree. The stones and the clay, and this is interesting. So there's some sort of an empire or movement that is a stone of some sort and then something that's clay. So the stones in the clay were cutting down the forest to make a place for themselves. And this is important because in the symbol of Okay, now listen to this. What does it mean that they were cutting down the forest to make a place for themselves? Listen to what the symbolism, what this is saying. You have a forest of trees and each tree represents a nation. So like in the Middle East now, you've got Israel, you've got Jordan, you've got Syria, you've got Lebanon, um, you've got Iraq, you've got Saudi Arabia, and Yemen and uh, Egypt, Cyprus, just all of those around in that area. So each one of those would be a tree. And of course, if there's a very special tree, which is an olive tree or a fig tree, depending on what's going on, that would be the nation of Israel. And in the symbolism, you, whenever you see an olive tree, it's the nation of Israel that understands the old form of Judaism and worships the Messiah as they should. Uh, so like the Essenes of the ancient times. So when they are in apostate form, they're worshiping other gods or they don't understand the Messiah, they don't believe that he's come, things like that. They would be considered a fig tree. So it's an interesting parallel. That reminds us when Jesus said, uh, you know, he cursed the fig tree because at that particular time, you've got Israel, uh, the leadership of Israel, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are non-believers. So the nation is in apostasy at that point. So everything is under this tree. The tree is the head of everything. So to be the actual government. And there's these movements coming up to try to destroy God's tree or God's form of government for the earth. And it says that um, the stones and the clay were cutting the forest down to make a, a um, place for themselves. Now notice this. Then also, We've got gold, silver, brass, and iron. And this is the same thing that we see in Daniel. So in Daniel... See? So we're going to end up touching on this a little bit more with what our sister had shared with me in, in something being spoken in Enoch. We'll go to it uh, after this. But we see this right here. Of course, we all know what this is, right? It's, it's the dream with uh, Nebuchadnezzar. I don't know. These always pop up small now. Okay, so it's with Nebuchadnezzar, the gold, silver, brass, iron, clay. Okay, we've understood what this is, and that's what he's talking about. And what do we know about this time? Right? We know, whoops, we know that this imagery from Daniel chapter 2 is prophetic to the time of the tribulation of seals. We know that it talked about it being in the latter days, the head of gold. And we know that even in the prophetic end of days, before the 14 years begins, the head of gold is gone. The head of gold isn't part of the story. It's gone. 
Okay, so it ends up getting destroyed, and you know it's been debated, and even with myself, I've gone back and forth on what it might mean over the years. I am heavily leaning. <coughs> Some people might say America, or you know, a city in America, but a lot of people are prophetically pointing to things that are about to take place in America, even before the elections. So it might be, um, and and I'm not saying it can't be. But I believe this is going to be connected to Iran, that Iran is going to be destroyed in that Middle Eastern war after everything breaks out. And I believe that's the head of gold because I believe these, this imagery mostly relates, as we've seen and as we'll go into, relates to these Middle Eastern nations. And that's you heard him just talking about how these things represent these empires and these taking over these nations and what these trees represented that are that are that are being taken by this stone and this clay and this you know gold and silver and so forth okay and what do we know ends up happening we know then the stone that smot the image becomes a great mountain what do we know about this it's something we've taught on many times over the years this is the lord coming this is the 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 stone the rock carved without hand that smot that smites the image and becomes a great mountain this is the Lord coming on whatever, as we've talked in the past, what this heavenly Mount Zion, when Mount Zion is coming and the Lord will destroy the enemies of Israel at that point, the end of the sixth year of seals, and then the mid-trib great multitude rapture in the seventh year will take place after he's dealt with those enemies <clears throat> and the image comes crashing down. Okay, so he's already already relating it to that. So we see here, as he said, the stones and the clay were cutting down forests to make a place for themselves. He explained what it was, that whatever, whatever system, whatever these, these stones and clay were, were a representation of, of a kingdom rising that was cutting down these, these trees, these nations, and taking them over. And same with the gold, silver, brass, and iron. <clears throat> the same thing is taking place as it says here we're cutting down the forest to make a place for themselves so all of these things were kingdoms rising in those areas in those nations and spiritually taking over those nations and were being ruled by them if you were these probably these entities or whatever ruling over them well they're all middle eastern nations Let's keep going. Paul's time, we, the stones and the clay are already gone. So we're gonna have to go back and try to figure out what those are. Stones and clay, and then other empires forming that are gold, silver, brass, and iron. Well, from Daniel, we know what those are. That's Babylon, Medio persia Greece, and Rome. And we're very much interested in the iron and then the clay that comes afterwards. And remember, this was in the was, right? We know there was the fulfillment of the is. So it's just like when we go to our seven churches. Oops, where is it? When we go to our seven churches, we know there's the was picture of it all. We know that there's the is picture of it all. And we know there's the end to come, the is to come picture of it. We know that it happened in, in, uh, in the was, and it took over 2,500 years. In the is, it's played out over about 2,000 years. And in the is to come, it's going to play out over 50 days and 14 years. That's wild. That's why, as, as, as I've said often, the end of days are going to be a time like never before seen in the history of humanity, in the history since the creation of the earth. So when people try to say, oh, no, the tribulation has already started, they don't yet understand what they're talking about. They don't understand what it means to be in the end of days. So they were also cutting down the forest to make a place for themselves. So one after the other. Um, a handful of trees, so to speak, get together and try to form an empire. And that's uh, these metal empires. Can a pocket translator beat a real translator? We tested it. Check out this brand new instant translation device. Uh, so uh, then I watched as the sun, the moon, and the stars cut down part of the forest to make it theirs. So then you've got the sun, moon, and stars. Finally, the swarming things of the earth and the water consumed it. All right. There you had it. He just explained what the cutting down did you catch that did you catch all of that 
He just explained what this cutting down of the forests is so that they can make a place for themselves and that the stones represented one empire rising, one kingdom rising, the clay was another kingdom rising, the gold, silver, brass, and iron were other kingdoms rising, that, that Noah was this big olive tree, and that from among it of the other trees that were there, other kingdoms started rising and coming together. Well, we know that historically. And we know that there's what? That there are seven of them. That there were seven. Well, aren't there the seven spirits? Like the, not the good spirits. We're talking about the the enemy. Remember the the angels that were cast out. You you'll see more of the connection to this. You're going to see how it even connects to the mountains of what we talk about prophetically in the is to come. But if all of those were kingdoms rising, Middle Eastern kingdoms, uh, uh, Rome, and these were the enemy kingdoms rising from the was and in the is, and we know their prophetic typology in the is to come, then what on earth is the sun and the moon doing also with the stars, cutting down the forest and making it theirs? Boom. Done. Let me zoom in there for you guys. Then I watched as the sun, moon, and stars cut down part of the forest to make it theirs. What on earth would the sun and the moon be doing cutting down parts of the forest to make it theirs if the exact same context of what the gold, silver, brass, iron, clay, and stones were doing represented these empires of nations rising and coming against to bring down, if you will, Israel or Jerusalem or the people and so forth. Why the sun and the moon, brothers and sisters? Why the sun and the moon? Because it told us right here. There is a reason the sun will be confounded and the, uh, the, the moon will be confounded and the sun will be ashamed. I had never, ever seen this before in my life till a couple days ago or yesterday. This is mind-blowing. This right here, right here, this little verse in this Apocrypha is the evidence of what we've been teaching that the sun and the moon have fallen. The sun is a typology represented as Lucifer which is a picture of the beast or the antichrist of the end of days. And the moon is a prophetic picture of the false prophet of the end of days. They are the ones that have fallen. <clears throat> you see, we see them even in, in you remember this, in, uh, Ma in Mark, in Mark's discourse. Once you understand, if you're new, that Mark's discourse begins at the red horse rider. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That these are the beginnings of troubles. All of this right here is the first about two and a half years of tribulation. World War III, beginning at the Red Horse Rider. And before the abomination of desolation, there is no mention of false Christs or false prophets. Because they're not on the scene yet. Oh, they, they're, they're there, but they're not given that full power and authority yet. Even though they might be in authority, they don't have the power given yet. Not until the time of the abomination of desolation in Mark's gospel, in Mark's discourse. This standing where it ought not has to do with the mark of the beast. The fleshly temple of the church that's still here, like Moses in the wilderness, and the portable temple covered in flesh. That's the people, that's the church that is there. And the time of the mark of the beast coming. And then look who shows up. Then you have false Christs and false prophets arising. This is the beast and the false prophet from Revelation chapter 13. You guys will remember this. I love this one. You go into Matthew 24. So if Mark's 
was the the six years of seals from the red horse rider to the end of the six year of seals when you come to matthew's discourse which would be the first half of trumpet judgments of the of the uh, of the uh, second set of seven years we see that only the false prophet is mentioned before the abomination of desolation in matthew's discourse and that's because we know that the beast the antichrist the the lucifer indwelled spirit beast is going to be killed when the lord comes um on mount zion and the false prophet isn't killed so that's why he's still somewhere on the picture but maybe gone away and in hiding and then what happens well, there's the abomination of desolation in Matthew's gospel, which is mid-trumpets. And at mid-trumpets, the pit is going to open when Satan is cast down. The pit opens, and now the beast comes back. The one who was, then was not, and now is at the abomination of desolation after the temple had been rebuilt in the first half of trumpets. Now the pit will be opened. Satan had been cast down. The pit will be opened. The beast will come back, and it's going to be whores more than seals even was. And look who shows up. False Christs and false prophets show up again. Where did the false Christ go to? Why wasn't he over here with the false prophet? Because he had been killed. He was, is not, and shall be, as we've taught many times in Revelation chapter 17. So what we're seeing here is exactly what we have been teaching when we go to genesis another thing that we taught on we know that the gap theory genesis verse 1 and 2 relates to those who have the spirit of god who are the sons of god who are in christ spirit filled going pre-trib and then there's a remnant worker from among them that will be here when the lord comes as light to begin his 40 days and when he does look at what it is day one two three four five six and then chapter two is verse is is the seventh day which is days to the lord god but a thousand years to us a day is as a thousand years and what did we see he did on the fourth day he made the two great lights right he made the two great lights and he made what uh uh and he made the stars also and what do we see happening it's not only the sun and the moon that fell, but we know some stars fell too. And these stars are representation of angels or spirits as we know that have fallen. So when we see the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, and all of that, we're going to see that it's these angel spirits, these, these fallen spirits that are the ones leading these nations that are leading what we're going to see, these mountains, as you're going to see. But just look at that. I was so excited when it, when it hit me as I was reading this because it proves that the sun and moon have fallen. It proves it. I should say, it confirms the proof that we have understood through the revelation of Scripture. Lucifer, the beast, represented as the, 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 the sun, and the false prophet represented as the moon. They are no longer in the firmament, and they have gone off course. Wild. There it is right there. In the testament of noah i love it i love it it was so exciting now let's go a little bit further let's go at to 1850 and we'll spend uh, just a couple minutes in here and let's have a listen to what he's talking about here cibc smart planner lets you set goals track progress and build momentum That's as close as I can. All right, here we go. Get it. Uh, this is from the Ezra Apocalypse, another translation we made. That's actually in the King James 1611 Apocrypha, uh, but it's older English and kind of hard to understand. But anyway, this is from chapter seven. He says, he answered me, not only that, but look at the earth. She has gold, silver, 
copper, iron, gold, silver, copper, iron, that's the same four metals in a row, and then lead and clay. Clay is interesting to be in there. But there's more silver than gold, more copper than silver, more iron than copper, more lead than iron, and more clay than lead. So kind of like what um, Daniel says about each kingdom coming after Nebuchadnezzar is more inferior than the last one. So inferior might be a bad way of translating it, but inferior, weaker, different in some way, not as strong. But so, more. and then here is from the ancient book of Enoch, another one of our books, but in Enoch chapter... There, now listen to this one. ...to 52, it says, these mountains on which your eyes have seen, he sees this vision of these mountains. So again, these mountain empires, there's a mountain of iron and a mountain of copper and a mountain of silver and a mountain of gold. Notice we're going backwards, but it's iron, copper, silver, and gold. And then what came before Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the mountain of soft metal and a mountain of lead. So that's really interesting. And these were all melt as wax before the fire, before fire in the presence of the elect one. So in, in the presence of the elect one, they will all burn as fire in the presence of the elect one. But did you catch what it said? We've been talking about the, the silver, the brass, the gold, and all of these things, that these are empires that are rising, right? What do we know there? Here in Enoch, they're called mountains. They're what? They're called mountains? Well, if we go to the book of Enoch, check this out. In the book of Enoch, this is interesting. Let's start in chapter 19, verse, uh, actually chapter 18 going into 19, uh, starting in verse 13, halfway through. I saw there seven stars like great burning mountains. What? Seven stars. Remember there was those fallen stars? Those, those stars that are paying the price? And it says, like great burning mountains. So these are represented as mountains. We know that in the end of days, these these the beast system has seven heads. And these heads, as we know, are what? Mountains. What are these seven stars? They're some of the fallen angels, which means these fallen angels, these seven stars, are the ones leading these nations that have risen up, represented as the gold, silver, bronze, brass, and all these. They're the mountains of the seven stars represented in the, the metals that we know prophetically are connected to the beast in the end of days and the nations that they're connected to for the most part. And to me, when I inquired regarding them, the angel, who was Uriel, by the way, this is really interesting. I've been studying into Uriel because of the, the things that have been going on with me for the last seven years. And it's fascinating because in Scripture, we have Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel that are all spoken about. But Uriel is the one who isn't mentioned in Scripture. But he is mentioned in a number of the Apocryphas. And Gabriel is believed with many things. He has the, 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 flaming, the flame of God, right? That's his name means. And so he's got the sword of God. But he also is said to be the one that holds the scroll of prophecy. That he leads the ones in prophecy. He holds the scroll and makes it known. And he's the only one not mentioned. And the prophecy is being revealed. And in the time of the end, he would be the one leading the group, if you will, in a way. He is the one of the four around the throne, right? He's the one with the scroll of prophecy. So while the other three have already happened, they still have their parts and things, of course. But Uriel is the only one that hasn't fully come on the scene because his time is prophecy. That's pretty wild. Especially when you understand that the other three were connected to one individual each in history. And Uriel, they've said, has had no connection to anybody yet. But it relates to prophecy. That's pretty freaky. Okay? So remember what I said about um, Isaiah 24. So what do we see? 
and I saw there were seven stars like great burning mountains. And to me, when I inquired regarding them, the angel said, the place is in the end of heaven and earth. This has become a prison for the stars and the host of heaven. Sound familiar? And the stars which roll over the fire are they which have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in the beginning of their rising because they did not come forth at their appointed times. Yikes. And, the, and, and Uriel said unto me, Here shall stand the angels who have connected themselves with women and their spirits assuming many different forms and defiling mankind and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demon, demons as gods. Here shall they stand till the day of the great judgment in which they shall be judged till they are made an end of. There's the seven. Plus we know the sun and the moon, the hosts of heaven as well. That's pretty wild. It's talking, this, it's telling us the same story as Isaiah 9. So if you have the seven stars and a prison for the stars and the host of heaven, sun and the moon, sun and the moon are representatives or represent the, the Lucifer and the false prophet or the beast and the false prophet. So, what we were seeing here is he was talking about Enoch chapter 52. Here's where we see it right here. Verse 5 and 6. And the angel of peace answered, saying unto me, Wait a little, and there shall be revealed unto thee all the secret things which surround the Lord of spirits. And these mountains, which thine eyes have seen, the mountain of iron, the mountain of copper, the mountain of silver, the mountain of gold, the mountain of soft metal, the mountain of lead, shall all these shall be in the presence of the elect of the elect one as wax before the fire it's telling us that what we have studied and what we understood in daniel about the gold the brass the iron the the clay he goes on to talk about what he believes clay is which is like uh, aluminum soft and, pli and pliable that relates to the clay. Everything has a context in relation to iron, in relation to, I should say, a metal, which means all of these are being head by what? They're being head by one of these angels. They're being headed, being called mountains, as the seven stars, which are the angels, that are going that are in their prison portion and they're also the burning mountains so they're represented as the angels there's seven of them there's mountains they represent silver gold iron that are these mountains represented by these seven we're getting more clarity here we're we're starting to see that what's happening is what was discussed right here the ones who are going to be the, the hosts of heaven and these stars being put into prisons and the sun and the moon being a part of it at their destruction, showing that the sun and the moon have fallen and their representation is also connected with these fallen angels who are these stars. And these stars are mountains being represented and they're the gold, silver, iron, and so forth. Look at where we see stars falling. At the end of the sixth year, at the end of the sixth uh, year in seals, right? Then the stars of heaven fell unto the earth as the fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Okay, this is then the Lord coming and everybody freaking out when the Lord is coming on Mount Zion with paradise. And there we see stars falling. And what does he do here? Well, we get it from Mark. We know that the, the beast and the false prophet have been here since about mid seals. And so who ends up getting destroyed 
the stars will get cast down, right? We have the beast that will get killed, and then the moon, who is the false prophet representation, is able to get away, but his power and dominion is taken away for a time. We've understood this, right? We go to Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation, sorry, not 7, in Revelation chapter 17, something we've taught on, which was another fascinating revelation, which was about the beast. In verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was. Okay, this is that second half of seals. This is Revelation 13, when he is given power to continue 42 months. He was, and then is not. So the first half of seals of the 14 years is war, approximately two and a half years is war. Then he gets his 42 months until the end of seals, which is called his was, and then it says, and is not. Why is the beast not? Well, just like in the first half of Trumpets, which is Matthew's discourse, you see that the beast isn't mentioned. And that's because when the Lord came on Mount Zion, he killed him and all those and threw him into the pit and all those that had come against him. We see this even in Second Esdras chapter 13. And then it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And that is the fifth trumpet. When Satan's cast down, the bottomless pit will be opened, and then he's going to ascend out of it and go into perdition, like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he will go into the temple declaring himself to be God. You see? It's the beast. It's the beast who is the son, who is indwelled by Lucifer. And it is the false prophet represented as the moon, the typology within the moon, who is the false prophet. And then he, where did he, what does he do? He then shows back up on the scene with the beast, with the, the false Christ in the second half of trumpets. Was, is not, and shall be. Now, what does it say about it? Let's see what it says about them. In verse 9, it says, and here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads, okay? The seven heads of the beast are seven mountains. Wait. Seven heads, and there are seven mountains. Wait. There are seven stars, and there are seven burning mountains. These are these fallen ones. These that will be in that prison. And we're seeing this same connection. He was saying, that the silver, the gold, right, as he was explaining it, that they were taking nations unto themselves. These are the beasts. These are, these are the, the, the spirits in the spirit realm, like the like scriptures tell us, that we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against the spirits and principalities. That's what's really going on. These spirits and principalities behind the scenes that are ruling over these kingdoms. And there's seven of them that also relate to the end of days. And they are, as we have shown and understood, these seven mountains that are representative of the beast when the seven mountains get their crowns. And then what does it tell us? And there are seven kings. So these are seven mountains. What do these mountains represent? They mean hill, mountain, of course, right? And it says there's seven kings which means these seven kings are in, will be indwelt by these demonic spirits. They are those seven stars, those spirits indwelling them that are creating this and causing this. There are five, seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the, other, uh, and the other is not yet. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was... And is not. Even he is the eighth. So what do we see? The beast that was. Which means the beast was the one from the was. Which means during seals. And then he is not. And then even he is the eighth. Which means he is from among the seven. Okay? Even he is the eighth and is of the seven. It doesn't mean he is the seventh. 
He could have been the third, the fourth, the fifth. You see, he's from among. He's of, from, among the seven. Well, which ones are these? Well, they're represented in, in the gold, the, the, the silver. Remember, the silver has two parts, media Persia. And then it has brass. Remember what it means? Remember this with, with the brass when we, when we went into this study? If we go into do, 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 Daniel chapter 10, Daniel chapter 10 is the third year of seals in the third year. So about two and a half years. And it says uh, in verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia without uh, uh, withstood me 21 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. And I remained there with the kings uh, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. What's he fighting? He's fighting in the spiritual. There's this battle taking place. And what do we see about it later? In verse 20, then said, then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia comes. So Persia, right? Media Persia or the silver. That's early on in tribulation. And then you have Grecia which is the copper. These are, these are, these are the, the nations, the leaders of these nations, these heads of the beast that these, that these stars, that these fallen angels are taking over. And it says, then, uh, lo, the, the prince of Grecia shall come. Everybody thinks that the prince of Grecia is going to be something related again to Greece. We've shown that it's not. It was, right? In the is, it was the Greeks. But in the is to come, it says also a place in Arabia. And few to any ever catch that. Few to any have ever, ever caught that. That's why having a program with the Strong's Concordance at your fingertips is such a big deal. This is about mid-trip. This is... The prince of Grecia, when he comes, which relates to Arabia, is connected to the bronze, which or the, the copper, what you know, in that same middle range, that is representative when the beast gets his power to continue 42 months. Did you hear that? In the story, right? In the story of the brass? This is where we have the head of gold, then silver. The head of gold is going to be gone quickly, then silver takes over. And it's two portions. And then what? Then the brass will take over. And then from among the brass, it's the same picture that we're getting. The other ones, and then it goes to iron and clay. This is the time frame in the prophetic picture of seals to when the Lord comes with Mount Zion when he comes as that mountain carved without hand that becomes a, 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 that stone that is from a mountain carved without hand and becomes a great mountain, that's the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. This is when the beast will get his power to continue 42 months. Remember how we were able to prove this? When we came to Revelation, as we were just showing in 17, we know that the beast has seven heads. And the eighth is actually from the seven. Well, that's because the beast that ends up getting killed comes back, right? And what do we see? That it had to do that these seven heads related to seven mountains. When we went to Daniel, and this was maybe a couple of years ago, when, we, when this was discovered, we saw right here. We saw, uh, starting in verse 8, uh, sorry, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 3, Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. Okay? Two horns. Is this hard for us to figure out? No. It explains the interpretation of the vision. Who's the ram? In the time of the end is the vision for. Who's the ram? Exactly like the silver. Media Persia. Hello. So it's not hard to understand, right? So we see the ram that has two horns. And then 
it says, I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward so that no beast might stand before him, neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I considered, behold, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the he-goat had a notable horn. So you had two horns, and now you've got one horn. And came to the ram that had two horns, which uh, I had seen standing before the river, and ran into him with fury of his power. Ran into the ram, which is moving collar against him, smot the ram, and broke his two horns. So now th there was two horns, then there was a third horn, and the third horn broke those other two horns. So now you've got a single horn standing. And then it says, And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, and he cast down to the ground and stamped him to the ground, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore, the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. So now the third horn is broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now, do we know this was something that already happened? Of course. This is what people do all the time. They understand what it means historically. What was it, Alexander the Great or whatever it was? Or whoever, I believe it was. We know historically. But everything is prophetic. They're, they're missing the understanding that this isn't only something that was, and even in the is, it is also prophetic giving us the is to come. These stories repeat in different pictures over and over and over again, all throughout Scripture, giving us different glimpses of details from each of their different portions in the way they tell their story. We've been doing this for seven years, showing it from Genesis to Revelation, all telling us the same picture, the same story, and within their details of different pictures, giving us more clues and hints as to how it plays out in the end. So we went one, two, then we went three, then two were done, and one was standing, then the one breaks off, and from it, four come up. How many is that? Seven. Seven. And then what does it say? Daniel 8, verse 9, Out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the west. It waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And he did magnify himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. Of course, this is the, the going and the killing of the Christians and so forth until the end of the sixth year of seals. So what did we see? Seven. And then what? Out of one of them came the eighth. What are these horns? Look at that. They're mountains. They're hills or mountains. Every one of these horns mentioned in Daniel chapter 8 are mountains. The same picture we were given in Revelation chapter 17. And each of these is also a picture of what? Not the head of gold, but what comes after the head of gold. Because the first two horns are Media Persia, the silver. So you've got a picture of it with the image of Nebuchadnezzar. You've got a picture of it with these rams and with these uh, um and with the goat. You've got a picture in the end of days where where it's talking about that the beast that has seven heads and then the eighth that is of the seven. They're all the same story. And when we took this back into Daniel chapter 7, we saw it says that there were four great beasts. And it says that came uh, uh, four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one, one from another. The first was like a lion. This is when Syria comes, Assad comes with his people at the end of the 50 and surrounds Jerusalem and destroys it. 
<clears throat> at the red horse rider and the tribulation begins. The bear is, of course, when it then, <clears throat> World War III will officially begin when Jerusalem is just hacked and destroyed. And then the bear, of course, is the world and Russia and so forth, believed to be, I believe. And then, of course, the leopard, I believe, is Germany and those over there in Europe that are with Germany. I don't know if it's directly the EU, but maybe something with that. And it has the body because it's going to be the control center. And then look what happens. Daniel 7.7. 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. Who is this fourth beast? Dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth and devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet. Well, we know that the beast is going to be stamping the residue, the crushing and killing the people for 42 months. And we read that in Revelation 11. Of it, uh, sorry, the residue uh, stamping with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. It had ten horns. So the beast has ten horns. Well, if we go to Revelation 13, you guys know this very well. Of course, the beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. But where were the ten horns? Are they all scattered? Are they all spread? Are they all spread throughout the the seven heads? No. The ten horns are on one head. You see? On one head. And what do we see about the beast? The beast which thou saw was like unto a leopard, right? There's the leopard, so he has dominion over it. Remember, he's going to be able to eat defeats. So he'll have power over the leopard. He'll have power over the bear, and he'll have power over the lion. And the dragon's given, going to give him his authority, his power in his seat. We saw that one of his heads, as it were, wounded unto death. And the whole world wondered after the beast. Remember one of its heads? Yeah. From, from the seven and from among the seven, the eighth comes. This is the wounded one of the seven, and it rises up again as the eighth. The horns are the horns that we see here. You see, these are horns. These, these are not mountains. The seven heads and to the eighth, their mountains. And we saw in Daniel 8 that these different nations and they're fighting against and how it splits up, these are the mountains. And these are the seven, and then the eighth is just one from among the seven. It didn't have eight heads. It had seven heads. And from among the seven, the eighth one comes back. And that's the deadly head wound. And everybody oohs and awes that it came back to power. And it's that one head that has the ten horns on it. Because that's the beast who has his power and his authority. And the ten crowns, as we know, the ten horns receiving their ten crowns, or when they get power with the beast one hour. The beast is the entire animal, but it's only head ruling at a time. And it's that final eighth one which is of the seven so it's not officially an eighth it is of the seven coming back and it's the one that has the ten horns and we're seeing it right here and so just like we saw what happens at the end of it we saw that when he has this dominion and and he can destroy and he's crushing them and destroying the gentiles what do we end up seeing well just like the story of the image of Nebuch with nebuchadnezzar we see at the end of the story, just like the ten horns, there were the ten toes. And what ended up happening? Then the Lord comes, the mountain of the Lord crushes the enemy, and it all comes cr crashing down. Well, look at what we see in Daniel 7 that comes next. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels a burning fire. 
a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, okay, this horn, look at this. It's not the beast. It's the, the little horn of the horns. It's not the horn from Daniel 8. That means mountains, which was the seven. And then the eighth came. That little eighth one that came back up from the seven. This is talking about the little horns from among the horns that came up from the eighth. And it says, uh, which spake great words, uh, which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain. You see? Because we know the beast is going to be killed. And who is the beast being headed by at this point? That final eighth one who is of the seven. It's really the, the head wound of one of the seven that comes back. And it appears to be Arabia. And it says, and his body was destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away and their lives were prolonged for a season and time. And then look at who shows up. And I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom. This is the end of seals. It's the same when the stone comes. And this is why people in a seven-year revelation, in a, in a seven-year tribulation understanding, will never be able to fully grasp these things. It'll always be twisted and confused. But to everybody else only understanding seven years, it'll make just as much sense to them because they're confused and not really understanding what it all means either. It's not until you get the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to and the 14 years that everything opens up. It's awesome. It is so incredible to bear witness of revelation being opened. To, to have understood, guys, that the sun and the moon are fallen and corrupted their ways. They're clearly not in the firmament anymore. We know that there are stars that were with them. We've talked about how Lucifer is a representation of the sun as, and the beast and, and the false prophet is a representation of the moon and the other beast. And we've been able to show these things and explain these things. We've been able to show why they're listed there in the days of creation, about the midst of the days of creation. Because it's about the same time connected prophetically to their showing up in the end of days. We were able to show it from, from Mark's gospel, into Math, uh, Mark's discourse, into Matthew's discourse, when they're there or not there. We were able to even show it in relation to the seven churches. And we saw how in the seven churches, with Pergamum in connection to the beast and the false prophet with Balaam and Balak in relation to the time of Pergamum when the beast would get his power to continue 42 months it's the same conversation time you've got the false prophet showing up and you've got the beast showing up the false prophet and the false Christ and when do they show up in the exact same church that says where Satan's seed is. And what do we see in Revelation 13? The beast gets his power to continue 42 months. Satan gives him his authority and his power and his seat. And then we read down and he's got this power over, over the saints. And then we have the false prophet show up who gives authority to uh, 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 like a uh, uh, credit to the beast that everybody should worship and it's the time of the mark of the beast which is Mark's discourse the fleeing into the wilderness brothers and sisters this revelation this this awesomeness of this confirmation of the sun and the moon having also taken for themselves forests in this chopping down is the evidence of what we have been teaching this is awesome 
this is awesome. So for, for those who are saying, well, I don't really think that the, the sun is really falling off course or, or that the moon, I think the moon is just doing and maybe we shouldn't account for the moon. If the Lord God is taking everything back to as it was in the beginning, and I was able to scripturally show you in Genesis chapter 1 that it was Taurus, that it was the beginning, that they made their alphabet accordingly, and that the sun was lit, and that the moon was lit when it was created. And that from that, eventually the sun falls out of the firmament, and so does the, sun, the moon, and so did some stars. And when they did, they came and they corrupted the people. And here we were, trying to understand it and make this count, knowing and diligently persisting in knowing that this is the 70th year. And we did this count from everything being together, stars, sun, and moon, as it was in the beginning, having counted it out and led us to our chapters to years in order. In the same count we've been doing for years. But we're only missing the portion of the fallen moon. If it was everything in its place in June, at the full moon, at the solstice, in Taurus, and every month falls by 0.93 something days per month for every moon, for every cycle of every month, then it equals approximately one, two, three, and three quarter days. This is why I wasn't only excited to share this, this additional count in the revelation that we have understood about the moon being off in its count, which we've known, which we taught earlier, which we taught earlier, which we then taught two years prior and had set aside, even though we were able to prove it and show how the Hebrew calendar was off and show the exact number of days within, say, one day, either side. We were able to show it. And I could do it for any single year, forward or backward. And yet we got to here and... I'll be I'll be kind to myself and say silly me I went and stuck with the freaking Hebrew calendar again but we had the stars we had the sun I hope I hope this is really driving in to understand this about three and a half to four days and the evidence is now understood it is here in the apocrypha confirming the revelation that we have been revealing here guys that the sun and the moon have also themselves fallen chopping trees to take them for themselves as well they are the ones leading this chaos they are the beast and the false prophet isn't that amazing? This should put to rest, in my opinion, this should put to, re to, put to rest anybody who is still questioning whether the sun and the moon were really off course. Because not only can we count it, not only could we go to the historical record, not only can we go to the beginning of creation, we can now get a literal confirmation from the Apocrypha, to show that indeed the sun and the moon with some stars have fallen from their positions. And we have understood how to count them, and we thank the Holy Ghost, unequivocally Holy Spirit-led, and I could say unequivocally because you guys have seen it for yourselves, on March 10th, 2020, when I prayed and nobody knew it about 11:30 at night taking a shower and saying lord if i have understood this the 50 and the 14 in the revelation of noon 
confirm it to me with a 50 days and that I was understanding it, that I'm on track, that I'm on target, that I've understood these things. And at about one o'clock in the morning, I get an email from Jodell saying, from the Holy Ghost, and I know what it means to say that. And in it, she says, I paused your video at the 50 minute mark, and the Holy Ghost told me to tell you, right on target. I was showing my wife this yesterday or a couple days ago. You guys realize, right on target does not mean a little bit off to the left or a little bit off to the right or up or down. It says right on target. Everyone you look at of right on target, it shows a picture of a bullseye. And the picture of the bullseye is what? Bullseye. You look at bullseye and you find out that Taurus, the left eye of Taurus called Aldebaran, is called the bullseye. Remember what it led us to? The right eye, the right eye of Taurus, the star of Taurus, and called the right eye. It, it, if, when we're looking at it, it's the right eye, but looking down, it would be the left eye. Is literally called Ayin, which means the sixteenth Hebrew letter, and it represents uh, seventy. And then Aleph represents one, right? Taurus represents one, the beginning, and then the other side is the Aldebaran eye which is called the bullseye of Taurus, right on target. And it's the 14th brightest star in the sky. And the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet is noon, which was what my video was about, revealing 1450 and its connection. And that is the 14th brightest star in the sky. And it 14 represents 50 in the Hebrew uh, numerically from the alphabet. And... That was all because the Holy Ghost confirmed that, that, the, that the teachings, that the revelation, that the understanding of the 1450 was right on target. And it led us to the beginning. It led us to the pendant that Christ was wearing, that they, they were able to see with all of this technology, that they were able to read the letters of the pendant from the Shroud of Turin. And it was... It was uh, Nun Aleph Ayin. The number 14, the number 1, the number 16. He was wearing a pendant that was the head of Taurus. Right eye, left eye, and beginning 1 representing Taurus. This was found after the revelation that began March 10th, 2020. And look at where we are. In the 70th year, when only this happens once for the next 30 years, and we do the exact same count we've always been doing, it brings us to here. And because I see this, as we did in the chapters to years, and it equaled everything else that we were looking for, equaling from a full moon, the fifth month, and the, the ninth day beginning it, it, was, it, it seemed, oh my goodness, there it is. The only thing was left was I once again forgot to account for the moon. And I just showed you, we can now prove that the sun and the moon have indeed fallen and that these counts that we've been doing, this understanding, this, this bringing it forward and trying to discern it and nail it down has not been in vain. It is connected to the sun the moon, and the stars as it was in the beginning. And I am hopeful <laughs> with all heavenly hope that we have finally, prayerfully, hopefully understood it in the, revel in the revelation of everything we've been given. We now have evidence, absolute evidence to build on the evidence that we knew we had to show that what we've been digging into, what we've been diligently seeking and searching out in this 70th year was in fact leading us to the final piece to understand that we had still, or I had still missed the moon because they indeed have both fallen. So brothers and sisters, with that, 
I pray this strengthens you. I pray it blesses you. I pray it, it, it draws you in closer to seek and search out these things. And it just fires you up as it does me every single time. And if this does come to pass, we're big boys, we're big girls. We can pull up our socks. We'll keep going. We will continue to diligently seek and search. But with everything we've been revealed, everything over the past seven years, everything from the 70th to the Gospels to the prophets to creation to the sun, moon, and stars, everything that I have understood to this point brings me to an end right here. Now you understand why I, I, I don't know how I could stretch the sun with the moon connection to here. I don't know how I could stretch the sun and the moon connection to here for these things to be pre-trib. This is the end of it for me in the 70 years. After this, it's just full-on prayer and diligently seeking, but not being able to come to you guys anymore with, uh, with an understanding unless the Spirit leads us in something else. But I hope and I pray, brothers and sisters, and I will stop carrying on after this. Just so happens, we have confirmed that Israel on. has. We spoke that this could be witnessed before the pre trib and the escape of the bride of Christ before Iran retaliates on Haifa and Tel Aviv. And it happened. So with that, brothers and sisters, I hope and pray the next time we talk, we'll be face to face, either prayerfully accounted worthy to be in the lowest room of the third heaven in the presence of the Lord and the Father forever, or that we will be girded about and waiting for the Lord when he will return from the wedding. And that when he knocks, we will be ready to open and join him wherever he gathers us all together to serve us and to eat with us the banquet meal, at which point he will finish the understanding of the revelation exactly as he told them in Luke chapter 24. Brothers and sisters, this is an exciting time like no other. And I look forward to meeting you at one place or the other, prayerfully. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.